I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Timer Hyatt, the Chief Operating Officer at PGIM, a $1.3 trillion asset manager across public equity and fixed income, private credit, real estate, and alternative strategies. Alongside PGIM's President and CEO, David Hunt, Timer distills insights from across PGIM's portfolio teams and shares long-term views on the investment implications of global megatrends annually. Their most recent megatrends piece, After the Great Lockdown, is the subject of our conversation. We cover Timer's lessons from academic research in economics, management consulting, and working at Lehman Brothers through the financial crisis, PGIM's business, and the Megatrends series. We then turn to the latest Megatrends piece and discuss the impact of the pandemic on supply chains, inventory management, weightless firms, commercial and residential real estate, remote work, and purposeful firms. We close with a discussion of investment opportunities coming out of the pandemic. If you're as intrigued as I was, you can see all the previous Megatrends reports at pgym.com. Today's show is sponsored by Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. Sophisticated multi-asset class investors need high-tech and high-touch data management solutions for their front and middle offices. Northern Trust Front Office Solutions combines high-powered functionality with exceptional client service to help asset allocators efficiently evaluate their portfolios, accelerate their insights, and mitigate their operational risk. Visit northerntrust.com slash solutions to learn more. Please enjoy my conversation with Timer Hyatt. Timer, thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be uh, here, Ted, at least virtually. Yeah. Why don't we just start with your background and how you got to the seat where you are today? I've been uh, in a bunch of places. I spent about 40% of my life growing up in Pakistan, then spent the next 20% in the UK, in England. And then I've been in New York since about 2001, so the last 40%. So straddled all continents. And I had a whole different career before I came to asset management and, and Wall Street. As a, I was a lecturer in economics, at Oxford. I was uh, doing a PhD in development economics. I was studying extreme destitution, how the poorest of the poor rise up. And is it the marriages and the demographics of where they're growing up? Is it the decisions they make? The entire other end of the spectrum between poverty and wealth. And made a transition or a transformation almost at some point from that world of academics and Oxford and tutorials to McKinsey Consulting Asset Management and where I'm now at PGM. I can't let you go without trying to understand what did you find in your academic research? So I found a few interesting things. Perhaps the most interesting thing was how owning any asset, particularly land, completely transforms the journeys people can make out of deep poverty. If you own a land the size of a tablecloth, it gives you access to credit markets in rural economies around the world, in poor countries. And that access to credit markets lets you weather storms in a way that if you have to pay for a big wedding, if you have to pay for the fact that you are unwell, small things that can tip people into destitution, you can protect your assets, your goats, your cows, your small uh, sharecropping piece of land. And that allows you to do much better. Even a tiny piece of land creates a binary outcome between people who end up surviving and thriving versus those who get sucked deeper into poverty. That was one of the few policy findings from what we did. And did you see anything come of those findings? You know, that was one of the reasons I left academics, the piece on land ownership. And it's a very complex topic linked to land reform and politics and wealth distribution. But academics in general is backward looking. You're looking at data that's five years old. So it's like looking out of the rear view mirror rather than looking forward. It's very isolatory. Everybody wants to be a big fish in a small pond. 
and a team coming together might make more progress than you can otherwise. And modern economics, this is a whole separate discussion we can have, is increasingly caught up in econometric complexity rather than trying to find policy conclusions that maybe don't have a 99%, sometimes spurious confidence interval, but actually are policy implementable. And that's what was one of the reasons that actually drew me out of academics and said, let's find something where we can make impact now rather than look backwards and get caught in that cycle. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, I've never heard someone talk about their upbringing in percentages. So where did that mathematical mind come from? You know, ever since I was 10 or 11, I wanted to be an economist. It was the one thing that uh, some of markets and how they worked, whether it was just the price of apples being set by the supply and demand curves, was something that really resonated with me as a way of thinking about the world and as a toolkit to understand it. And I think with that came this idea of a very structured way of looking at the world and the percentages. <laughs> so what does the lens of a management consultant look like on the asset management world? I think my lens on asset management is a combination of management consulting and academics. So I think what academics brings is, particularly if you're doing it in a cold, dark, isolated room in England without a team around you, it brings the need for a lot of structure to what you're doing, to be extremely disciplined and organized and think three steps ahead. Because if you lose your way in British academics, there's no one who sets you right for a very long time. So I think that sort of discipline was one piece that I bring to asset management. And I think in management consulting, it brings the lens of not just looking at your own company, but looking at peers, looking at benchmarks, looking at other industries, and therefore kind of widening the lens from a sort of narrow telescope to much more of a sort of spectrum of views. For example, in technology, institutional pharmaceutical sales is far more ahead of our institutional asset managers work. What can we learn from those other sectors? So that generalist education, I think, is what I bring to bear. And then how did you decide to go from McKinsey into asset management? I think at some point you get tired of being on the outside looking in at a company. You recognize that some of the real challenges are around talent and organization and how to convince people to do things rather than what the five-page PowerPoint answer is. And you can really only do that as an insider, I believe, rather than as an, as an outsider. So, so I just wanted to change the lens. I didn't want to be the photographer taking the photograph. I wanted to be in the picture deciding how to influence things. And what was that first step outside of McKinsey? The first step outside of McKinsey was Lehman Brothers, an interesting choice in 2006 when I joined them. But a company that had both asset management, they owned Newberger Berman in those days, that had the capital markets business, that had investment banking, and had a team of strategists that were doing quite a lot of interesting work going into emerging markets. If you recall, back in the day, Lehman had, for the first instance, uh, nearly had a liquidity crisis when Russia happened, long-term capital management. And therefore, there's a wariness around emerging markets, which, of course, had come a long way by 2006. And we spent a lot of time thinking about what do we do in China, what do we do in emerging markets, how do we structure joint ventures around the world. And that seemed like an interesting growth journey at the time. So were you there through the collapse? I was there through the collapse and beyond the collapse. And I think what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I actually learned some of my most valuable lessons at Lehman Brothers. As I saw our stock price plunge to zero, as I saw management changes around us, as we were on the phone with uh, Geithner talking about becoming a bank holding company, I think dealing with extreme tail risk, dealing with clients and employees in crisis gave me some of my most important lessons in resilience and calm and how to handle downside risk even as you pursue growth opportunities. What were your biggest takeaways? Those are some great ones about interpersonal qualities. What were your biggest takeaways from the business from that time at Lehman? I think we could probably have a whole separate podcast on the lessons from Lehman, but I'd say a, uh, one certainly is concentration risk. Have a diversified portfolio of ideas, of businesses, of asset classes, of securities in terms of how you lay your chips as a business so that you can weather different market environments. And second, don't get so caught up in competing with others who may have very different balance sheets or asset bases relative to yours. 
that you end up creating leverage or equity situations where you may not be able to survive when markets turn. So what was it like? You've stepped into the business and now the business you stepped into is no more. What was it like in that next step, figuring out what to do? It was sort of everything was a little bit in slow motion, even as it was moving so fast. It's strange how the brain sort of tries to cope with all the changes and volatility and turbulence that was going on outside there. But inside the company, as the next wave of leaders tried to change it, I think there was still calm, a sense of a business plan. And I think the sense that the regulatory agencies would step in in some way or a bidder would come in and preserve Beeman in its, in, in its entirety, which never quite happened for a range of reasons. But I would say the best business leaders, the ones who were my mentors, remained calm. I think they were actually quite cognizant of the risks that existed at that point and really tried to find the best fiduciary path through that. That wasn't true for everyone, but certainly the ones that I worked most closely with in those final months. And what did you do? I continued to work for the complex web of transition service agreements between Lehman and Barclays and various other bankruptcy courts. And then having transitioned most of those topics to the next generation of Barclays leaders, I moved to Credit Suisse and to the CSAM, which is the asset management business at Credit Suisse and brand product development and strategy for them globally. Credit Suisse is very international. Obviously, the big hub is Zurich and managed uh, products around the world for Credit Suisse's asset management business. And how long did that last before you found your way to PGM? I was at Credit Suisse for about five years and we transitioned from moving out some of our smaller, long-only businesses that we sold to Aberdeen into more of an alternative-centric boutique in the U.S. and focusing our European efforts mainly on private banking in Switzerland and Germany. And I had a great run there. I think I gained, learned a lot around product development discipline. It's not just about launching new products, but what is the tale of products that haven't worked? Be proud of your failures, but also end them when you need to. And Pigeon was at a very compelling point when I joined uh, roughly seven years ago. It had uh, weathered the global financial crisis, but was still a very U.S.-centric business in terms of mainly serving defined benefit pension plans in the U.S. A few of our underlying multi-manager businesses had stepped into other regions. And there was a real desire by the senior leadership team to globalize the business and make it a truly international business. And that's not just about sourcing clients in other countries, but about where our talent was the investment strategies we offered. And that seemed to be an extremely exciting growth journey, and I wanted to be part of that. Why don't you touch a little bit on the history of PGM, which is just this phenomenal organization that maybe may not be as well known despite its size? We are trying to change it, but to some extent, it is one of the sort of best kept secrets in asset management among the top 10 asset managers. So We have about 1.3 trillion in assets, largely third party. 80% of our fees come from third party clients, institutional and retail. And we are organized as seven different businesses, each with a fair degree of autonomy and each focused on a single asset class. So it's a craft business at the level of each underlying business, focused on a single asset class with investment professionals whose cultures, while they have some common themes like long termism and risk management discipline, are quite different. We have a quant business called QMA, where you have people who I'm sure love Star Trek and sitting in their t-shirts writing code. And then you have our private debt business, one of the largest in, in the US and Europe, where you have people who are credit analysts and thinking about borrower relationships and originating assets across the country. Very different temperament. And we celebrate those multiple investment cultures as long as at the center of each one is an institutional or retail client and meeting those obligations to them. But the origin of all this was, first, the general account of Prudential back, you know, 70, 80 years ago and managing their money. And in the late 1990s, John Strangfield, who later became the CEO of Prudential, but was the head of PGM at that point, said to really get the best investment performance, I need a team of investment talent that is the best in the industry at generating institutional quality investments. And for that, I need to build a third party business because to get the best talent and to have somebody who doesn't just hire you, but can also fire you when you underperform, you need third party clients. 
And I was reading the first documents from the 1990s that said, you know, we might have some success with defined benefit plans. It's going to be small. There are many competitors. Now we serve pretty much the vast majority of the top 100 pension plans in the world. And John also built this as something that has scale, but also depth. So we try and do both. We have these craft asset class boutique managers, but we also try and leverage the power of being a 1.3 trillion manager and the increasing number of areas where scale is critical and where the power of being at that scale really helps us with clients and in making investments that others really can't afford to make. We could go on and on, and maybe we'll have to sometime talking about all the intricacies of PGM as a whole. But what I really want to focus on is part of this series you've been involved with called Megatrends. So it's, I guess, relatively new in your seven-year tenure, but why don't you touch on what that is, and then we can dive into the most recent work. So the power of Megatrends, I think, is actually quite inextricably connected with the PGM model. Because we have the unique ability, and I have a unique ability in my seat as CEO of Cross PGM to tap into the collective thinking and the asset class thinking of managers that range from private debt to direct real estate to commercial mortgages to, of course, PGM fixed income and the public fixed income markets, and then both a quant and a fundamental lens into the equity universe and asset allocation. So we wanted to take teams where we could bring all these researchers and portfolio managers together and say, let's look at big secular trends that may not change the world in six months, but will certainly influence what the investment landscape and opportunity set looks like over three to five years and the risks and get all their perspectives. And that means we are not trying to sell a particular position. We are capturing our best ideas across public and private markets, equity and fixed income and real assets. And what a unique chance, if nothing else is an excuse for me to spend time with some of the most thoughtful investment professionals we had to understand how they think about these longer term trends, while obviously they also spend a lot more time on the tactical side. And what's the process for bringing the people together? So we do it in two ways. We have a thought leadership council. It sounds grander than it is, but we bring one or two of the key researchers in each of our seven businesses together and get their best ideas of what is influencing their long-term thinking, what they think. And by long-term, I think it's important. We are not futurists. We try and avoid trends that might have a 20 to 30 year impact, but very little impact before that. Our sweet spot is three to five years, but we get that group together. We get some of our institutional coverage people together and say, what are clients asking you about? And that leads to a short list of five or seven ideas. And every year we take one idea and bring all these investment professionals in one-on-one in-depth interviews and then collectively to debate them when there's a bid ask in views. There's no single house here at PGM. There's a multitude of views, which is one of the power of the models. We've had Nobel Prize winners, IMF economists, others jump in as well and share their perspectives too. So it's kind of a combination of the external and the internal. And then how do you distill all that information into one of these papers? Many, many weekends. And I think it brings back the power of my lonely years writing my PhD thesis and trying to uh, add structure and logic while still reflecting the diversity of views. But I think the key lens we take is what were the chief investment officer of a sovereign wealth fund, major pension plan, public or private and endowment? What would be on their mind? And we try and apply that CIO lens to how, we, how they would navigate the issue. And that's kind of the frame for the writing. And is the cadence of this intended to be once a year? Sometimes we get excited by other topics. So when a range of nationalist leaders rose across the US and Europe, we did a report on the ongoing tussle between sovereignty and nationalism and who will win in the short term, which was nationalism, but why we think there's still lots of reasons why globalization ultimately will prevail. And this year with the COVID crisis and lockdown, We did a report not on all the very important tactical steps that market participants need to think about right now and on the alphabet soup of recovery parts that they're focusing on, U, V, W, but more around once the crisis is over, once the great lockdown is over, what will happen next? And that also was a special report because we were working and continue to work on climate change as the next big megatrend we are discovering. Obviously, these megatrends are also deeply interrelated with each other. So we're now getting a quite interesting body of work that has lots of cross-cutting teams, most of which are proving true. 
this most recent one you put out is called After the Great Lockdown. And why don't we walk through sort of what you found from these conversations with your team? So I think the most compelling single theme across the report is that the cost of doing business and building resilience in business has gone up in the underlying companies that we as asset managers look at, whether it's private or public, the debt or equity of these companies. And that's for a variety of reasons. The first of which is supply chains. And we believe supply chains will actually barbell or bifurcate in two different directions. The current model of finding the cheapest cost location, often China, in which to place your globally linked supply chain will change. It was already changing because of the trade war and rising labor costs in China, but that's going to accelerate into two models. On the one hand, you're going to have a bunch of companies that will remain committed to globalization, but will now have more redundancy and resiliency in supply chains that are in multiple locations. Places like the Philippines, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Mexico will gain as a result of that kind of second location as they scale back in China and scale up there. And the second group of companies, and even beyond the sectors where governments will intervene, like medical supplies, will reshore. That's partly because automation has lowered the cost of coming back, partly because, you know, in some way, the human psyche does believe it's easier to keep track of your supply chain if it's in Arizona versus 10,000 miles away. And they'll reshore into Canada for the U.S. companies, into Canada, Mexico, and back into the U.S., or for European companies into Eastern Europe or back into their home markets. And while automation brings some savings, costly, these are more costly than they would be otherwise. So the cost of doing business will go up, first of all, because the supply chains bifurcate in two directions, both of which increase expenses. On that first part of diversifying, let's say, away from China, though it's not necessarily that specific, how does a company determine What's sort of the optimal amount of diversification? Ultimately, over the long term, it'll come down a little bit to how equity and debt investors perceive the cost of additional resilience. We believe in the medium term, investors will be willing to give up some of the upside of the leanest possible supply chain for a more resilient supply chain that can weather other tail risks. Most of them are knowable that might strike in the future. And while not all of them are preventable by having a multi-location, more redundant supply chain, some of them certainly are. And our belief is that investors will value that more and diligence that more, and therefore companies will be willing to invest because they'll be rewarded in their valuations for that. I think the key thing here is it's not just about manufacturing. This is also about food supply chains. We saw how the lack of ability for migrant workers from North Africa or Eastern Europe to come to Europe affected food supply chains there. America was trying to barbecue with potentially a shortage of beef burgers right here. And even in the services sector, as Ireland and India went into a lockdown, it became quite hard for some people to kind of have their call centers and other places operate effectively. So this is going to actually impact all sectors. And I think there will ultimately be the right balance between what is too much redundancy and what will investors ultimately value as the right level of downside protection. What are some of the other issues that companies now have in their supply chains that they might not have appreciated before? Well, I think in supply chains, one other was just knowing what's your second level of supplier. So you may know your direct suppliers, but who are your suppliers to your suppliers? And that brought about a third piece, which is, have you digitized your supply chain? Do you have at your fingertips, perhaps from where you're stuck on a remote working situation yourself, able to understand where things are in the supply chain, what's working, what's broken. And I think investments in digitizing the supply chain and doing more due diligence of second order supply chains will grow. And many of these supplies are shared. So I think increasingly companies will think about what are the lower order parts of my supply chain that I want to make sure don't go bankrupt just because another company might have stopped using them. Some of this change in digitization and automation, there's been this big wave towards just-in-time inventory management. How have you thought about that lens on supply chains and running businesses? So we divide the world into two kinds of goods, perhaps somewhat simplistically, but I think usefully. We think on the consumer goods sides, the goods you and I and others listening to this podcast might purchase, there is a lot of substitutability. So you can use 
office grade toilet paper, residential toilet papers in short supply. If you can't get your beef burger, maybe you can get a lamb burger. If you can't get Diet Coke, maybe you can get Diet Pepsi. So there is a lot of substitutability in the consumer side. And there we think just the increasing use of big data and data analytics to predict consumer demand and actually reduce the amount of inventory will be a more powerful force than the fact that there were shortages in certain areas. Further up the chain in manufacturing and capital goods, where substitution is much harder, you can't suddenly find another door handle for the car you're manufacturing if your door handle manufacturer has supply chain issues or is under lockdown. We do feel that the parts that are used to manufacture the end product will get more robust. And perhaps companies are thinking they went a little too far down the just-in-time spectrum and they need to be a little further on the just-in-case spectrum as well. You know, it feels like another dynamic, certainly in the markets, has been this bifurcation of these tech giants who have outperformed in the worst part of the pandemic compared to some sort of old line businesses that struggled with these supply chain issues. I know you've, you've talked some about this concept of a weightless firm, and I'd love you to flesh through what that means, both coming out of the pandemic and then also what it means as a megatrend on its own. Maybe as a megatrend on its own first, we have seen firms that focus on intangible assets, software, data, algorithms, design, R&D, succeed and thrive. And for those components, hard as they are to value, and some of them are not even captured under gap accounting as assets, R&D is an expense, become much more important in driving value than some of the traditional factors of production like machinery or labor or factories. And 85% of the value of the S&P 500 is now driven by intangible assets, according to some studies, up from about 20-25% a few decades ago. So intangible assets are increasingly driving value. And we think this is not just true about the narrow technology sector or just Silicon Valley. It's true about any company in any sector. It could be retail like Amazon. It could be energy and mining that is leveraging technology and data and these intangible assets to change how they work and to change how they do business. And those companies are leapfrogging ahead of those who have been unable to make that transition. Leads to a couple of interesting investment implications. For one, we believe some of the classic credit rating models undervalue intangible assets and the variabilization of costs of intangible models versus ones where you have factories and machineries and equipment. And think of those old legacy tangible assets as collateral in the credit markets, for example, whereas in reality, the flexibility of intangible models, the ability to change and transform based on circumstances and to have a capitalized footprint actually gives them an advantage. So we've definitely seen opportunities for arbitrage versus credit ratings and how credit securities are priced because of that intangible trend. But it's powerful. What are some of the other implications on markets of these weightless firms? I think one other interesting implication is that because the capital needs of intangible asset firms are not as intense as firms that were tangible asset heavy, and because often their secret sources are R&D and algorithms that are, they'd rather not reveal in public markets, and combined with the fact that might change after the coronavirus-induced recession, but has been true so far of a glut of private capital that has gone way past Series A and can keep companies private for pretty much as long as they like, both rationally and irrationally, that companies have stayed in the private sector for much longer and perhaps permanently versus five, 10 years ago. And that means any institutional investor, any investor really, does need to think about if they want to capture this opportunity about private equity and private debt alongside public equity and public debt, particularly when they look at the G8. I think in emerging markets, more of these intangible heavy companies are listed than here. How have you seen, you know, and some of your clients and a lot of the people I talk to on the show have multi-asset class portfolios. How does that transition of more capital getting deployed in the private markets and fewer public companies 
turn into potential shifts over the years in asset allocation structures? Well, it's interesting on the less listed public companies. Again, it is a US and perhaps European phenomenon. You are still seeing lots of IPOs and new companies accessing public markets in China and emerging markets. And we think that's good. It's good for the democratization of equity markets and capital. And part of the answer to some of the inequalities in wealth that we are seeing grow. We are seeing a bigger driver of asset allocation being the search for yield. And that search for yield is driving people to higher risk products within public markets. So do you think more about emerging market debt rather than investment grade debt, as an example? Folks looking more at, say, global equities rather than just large cap domestic equities, and certainly looking for kind of the higher yields you do get in private markets. So the combination of all those factors is driving to greater allocations to privates. I think given some of the high valuations pre-coronavirus, particularly private real estate debt and private debt, rather than necessarily private equity, where there was perhaps more of a sense of a bit of a bubble, but absolutely a perceptible shift. It's the first question that clients ask me when we have conversations with them is, how should we be thinking about privates? What is the right balance between the liquidity we might need to meet our participant needs or for a cash requirement at some point, and how much we can invest in private asset classes? Whenever we come out of this, there's always this notion that you go through a crisis and certain firms come out stronger. And others, in this case, there's a lot of potential bankruptcy risk. You've talked some about these superstar firms, these technology winners. What are the implications of that on portfolios going forward? So I think the easiest megatrends to predict or the easiest trends impacted by COVID-19 and the resulting humanitarian and economic crisis are ones that are accelerations of things already underway. We can talk later about things that we think might be a little bit of a reversal, but those are always harder to predict and sometimes don't always come true. But I do think the rise of the waitlist firm has accelerated and will lead to even greater success of companies that are revolutionizing their business models through the use of technology and technology platforms. An obvious example of a winner and loser is I think this accelerates the demise of the department store anchored retail store and the retail companies that operate in that environment and increase online delivery mechanisms, including retail and including the quite fascinatingly luxury goods. So Gucci actually saw a 21% increase in online sales in Asia on the luxury end of the spectrum, even as their store sales went down. So luxury brands are even building direct consumer connections rather than working through wholesalers and department stores. So I think those wholesaling intermediaries, retail-driven department stores, those models will be much more challenged than ones that rely on technology. And that includes companies that are part of the cloud computing infrastructure, not just the big AWS, but also people who provide cloud security, cloud transmission services around the cloud. I think it'll be good for companies that support remote working, video conferencing, video apps, including the one we're using right now. It'll be good for streaming media. I think apart from big sporting events, the time when people are willing to sit through a bunch of ads as they watch their favorite TV programs may well be over. So streaming apps will do well. I think 5G more generally will do well as wireless speeds become more important. And in real estate, certainly the data centers and cell phone towers that power this technology-centered world will become more important. I, I think more broadly, technology is the new infrastructure of the U.S. and global economy, and firms that participate in that will do well. One of the things people are talking a lot about through this pandemic is what the future looks like of real estate, particularly, say, commercial real estate, but also residential. And I know that's one of the after effects of the great lockdown you talked about. So I'd love to hear your perspective on all things real estate. Absolutely. So maybe let's do a quick asset class tour within commercial real estate. I think in terms of accelerating trends, the trends to logistics and distribution facilities, particularly those supporting the last mile delivery of goods and products to consumers around the world will grow. This is not just about the big US and European companies. There's a whole range of local oligopolis and monopolists in different emerging markets 
that control those markets. So it's actually quite a broad set of companies that fulfill that function. Mercado Libre in uh, Latin America, for example, is one. Second, cold storage facilities as groceries go online as well. Nobody wants to touch that cold tomato or squeeze that line before they buy it, but are willing to buy it online. I think that would be a permanent shift in the convenience factor. So cold storage real estate will grow. We do think the demise of the office is a place where people convene, where companies' cultures and visions and missions are reinforced, particularly for new employees as these companies grow and change will remain more important than those who say everybody will move to remote working. But undoubtedly, you will have about, let's call it 15, 25% of employees, anybody's guess, who might be able to work more remotely on more days. And we think it will lead to a rise in hot desking and more efficient use of office real estate space. At the same time, probably the size of cubicles and spaces will grow. There's only so much you can do with plexiglass. And that will act as a bit of a counterbalance. But we do think humans ultimately treat offices as part of their social network. And we are social creatures. And companies ultimately are a combination of the cultural features that make one company in a sector different from another. And you can't reinforce that through complete remote working. So we do think offices will exist, but they'll need to be reimagined and they'll need to be much more flexible. Senior housing at the low end has seen a lot of really sad and tragic stories come out of that. We do think it'll lead to a reform of what that looks like. But nevertheless, the aging wave, something we've written about in another mega trend, is true. It's not just true in the US, it's true in China and Italy in the UK. And we do think ultimately safe senior housing will continue to grow. And then the final question is residential tech, which is very interesting. What happens to big cities? And what are your thoughts? So this is one where you have had a positive trend for the last five, 10 years for people to kind of try and embody this live, work, play lifestyle where you can walk to your restaurant, walk to your job, walk to the theater. And that's created hubs in places like Atlanta and Nashville and Austin. And of course, made big cities like New York and London and San Francisco even more attractive, not just for millennials, but also for baby boomers who become empty nesters and return there. So this one is one that had a very rich range of views within PGM as we talked to folks, because it is a bit of a reversal. But we do have a sense that certainly the desire for safety and security and personal space will grow. That's a couple of micro feature trends. So micro apartments in New York City, where I live, have become really popular, where you have a really tiny footprint, smaller than a studio, but lots of internal shared community space. You've got your movie theater, you've got your indoor saltwater pool. And we think we might go back a little more to construction where you have more internal community spaces that are gardens, but also people will want slightly bigger footprints again within cities when they recognize that they might need to spend months there. And certainly there is a group of baby boomers who might rethink their move from the suburbs back to dense urban centers. And millennials who may be at that transition point anyway to moving to suburbs who might accelerate that decision. So cities will thrive. Cities are where we innovate. Cities are where new ideas emerge. Cities are where people connect. But we do think suburban properties will become more relatively attractive as people look for safe personal spaces. One of the trends that has been quite a buzz in the commercial space has been this sort of co-working. And WeWork was a bellwether for lots of things, not the least of which maybe the peak unicorn trying to go public. And this was a mega trend that seemingly COVID has meaningfully shifted from something that looked like it would accelerate to something that is hard to see how it will be the same. What's your perspective on that particular issue of co-working spaces? So we were always skeptical about the ability of some of the co-working models because of their unique personal balance sheet situations to weather a downturn. And there's a rich history of co-working and flexible space providers weathering downturns badly. But nevertheless, we believe there were some virtues in what the co-working model did, let alone specific companies like WeWork that had some additional issues. And that include shortening commercial lease lengths and increasing the attractiveness of amenities for particularly millennial workers at these places who kind of valued a different kind of vibe. 
We do think that trend is going to be curtailed by the coronavirus situation as employees and their companies from both a liability and risk perspective and because they care about their employee safety will want to have their own standards of what is sanitary and safe and protects people. And that requires less shared amenities, more spaces that are yours, and maybe longer term investments in all the things that you require, whether it's the ventilation systems or flexible panels between cubicles. That means that you may want to make longer term investments in spaces you earn rather than having super flexible and shared co-working spaces. So I think it's a headwind. If you look at companies in this notion that there'll be more remote work, I'm curious about how that plays its way through almost in the hierarchy of a business, because it feels, at least for now, like the senior people that have more control over their own times and schedules are the ones that are leaning towards some remote working. And I'm curious if you found that to be the case, both conceptually within PGM and then also broadly. Well, I certainly think more broadly that the COVID-19 crisis has led to an exacerbation of both people understanding and the perception of inequalities between those who had the resources to weather the storm and perhaps leave dense urban centers to safer places, and those, whether they were essential workers or low-income workers who had no choice but to survive the storm at its center. So... Concepts of inequality and injustice, I think, will be a key part of the geopolitical conversation. And the political conversation, as you know, is increasingly part of what moves markets. So it it is something every investor needs to think about. I have found, at least among my teams, that the experience of working under the lockdown has been very varied. And I would say that's across all levels of seniority. Some people have really found the absence of the commute, the ability to spend time with their kids having meals and discussing what's going on in the world, actually quite refreshing. They miss their colleagues. They miss what one of them said was a 3D view of the world rather than the 2D view through Zoom and WebEx and so on. But they have found that quite empowering. And others who really miss that connectivity, the ability to swing by someone's office and have a quick chat, maybe go for a drink with colleagues afterwards, and are itching to be back on planes, on trains. They aren't because they want to keep societies and communities safe, but that's their desire. I think it cuts through all levels in seniority. And we'll end up, I think, with a new equilibrium where there'll be a range of employees in roles that perhaps don't require them to come in every day who will say, I can be as effective and as productive even if I work remotely two days a week or if I spend more time visiting my clients or real estate properties rather than coming into the physical office. I think the office and work have been untethered, and I think that will be permanent for some group of people. And I think the transaction costs, the complexity of figuring out how to log into a video conferencing system, which never quite worked perfectly when we were all in the office, but now is working remarkably well because people have invested the time to figure out how how that works. Those transaction costs, while they're small, really prevent new behaviors. We've spent that money. We've taken that cost. I think that will lead to some permanent changes in how people value remote working. How do you think that the management of companies will consider going forward this, let's call it inequality that has exacerbated over time? And now moving forward, you mentioned earlier ESG as a potential paper. Just sort of thoughts on that whole movement. So as part of the future means business, our megatrends are talked about kind of big ways corporate archetypes are changing. One of our trends was the purposeful firm. And we argue that Milton Friedman orthodoxy, that shareholder value maximization is the only thing a company should care about. Whether you agree with that view or not, companies can no longer afford to be perceived to be following that philosophy. And some of them are walking the walk, but all of them are talking the talk they all recognize that there's a much broader alliance of stakeholders, their own employees, their customers, regulators, the communities in which they operate in. And they need to be seen as considering the views, the rights, and the responsibilities to that broader community. 
And I think that is one of the reasons that you've seen with some of the current unrest around racial injustice, around some of the inequalities laid bare by the pandemic-driven crisis, that you've seen corporate leaders come out publicly and voice their support on these issues. It is something that many of them personally believe passionately about, but it's also that moment in the zeitgeist when increasingly corporations are being looked at, not just to maximize shareholder value, but to represent the coalition of stakeholders that the companies work with and partner with. And I think you're seeing it, and I think it's a good thing. You touched on investment implications of this, and I've just done this whole series on ESG and sustainable investing, and and curious your thoughts of how this plays through in the markets over time. I heard the series on ESG, and I'd encourage everyone interested in ESG investing who integrate ESG into the investment process to listen to it. It was fascinating. So I think it's extremely complicated is the first thing to bear in mind, because there are multiple layers of obfuscation that happened. First, we talked about the company itself, the end company you might be investing in. Many of them will talk the talk, but not walk the walk. It's a marketing and media exercise in some cases, rather than a real exercise. And you've got to find metrics that actually tell you which companies are actually taking real actions that are going to have tangible impacts on ESG rather than merely making it part of a marketing machine. And there are things like how many pollution incidents you've had, actual stats on diversity and so on that can give you a sense of that. The second layer then is, even if a company is actually doing something, does it have a material impact on their investment returns? Does it affect valuations? There might be very good social things a company is doing that the market is not yet rewarding or that improve the social well-being of a company but may not improve its valuation outcomes. And then if you're an ESG investor, those are great things to invest in because you've made sure they're tangible and real and you care about them intrinsically. But you might also want to separate things that are material movers of valuation. Things like board governance, for example, that has lots of empirically proven ability to change things. Things like climate responsibility that might create litigation risk and therefore affect long-term value. And you might want to separate out those material factors. And then for those material factors, you wouldn't want a separate ESG process sitting off on the side. You'd want to integrate it deeply into your investment process because it affects value and it's material to value then it must be part of your core process, regardless of whether you're a deep ESG believer or not. So that's kind of how we bifurcate it. And then finally, asset managers themselves can greenwash. And as an end investor, you need to see, in addition to kind of the walkers versus the talkers, versus the material factors, versus the factors that socially matter, but are not material for valuation, whether the company is integrated, how much is the company greenwashing their results, versus truly has an ESG process that's integrated into the core of how they make investment decisions. For those who walk through all those four hoops successfully, we do think, particularly for long-term investors, there's real value in some of the factors that underpin ESG, which is a broad term that includes things that move the needle and things that don't. And what are some of the ones you think are the most impactful? I mentioned board seats as one, but an interesting anecdote is that QMA, our quant business, did some great analysis on what is considered a linear relationship where, you know, very mature boards are considered to be less dynamic than new boards. And in reality, when you explore the valuation relationship between board length and tenure and valuation, it's a curve relationship where very new boards might reflect a lot of flux and change. And indeed, very Long tenured boards may affect a lack of ability to move, and there's an optimal sweet spot. So, these relationships are of a non linear governance, I think, is a good example. I think the longer your horizon, so private equity, infrastructure, real estate, these things become much more obvious. There are many things like you know, safety standards in, in our buildings, the kinds of tenants you have, how much energy efficiency have you created through being more aware of climate change. Are you thinking about flood risk versus your portfolio of infrastructure and real estate investments? Those are some of the obvious ones. There are many more that work in a nuanced manner. And I think increasingly the ESG effort is really focusing on asset managers to really think very thoughtfully about each of those and how it moves value versus those that haven't yet been priced in. Now, we started this whole conversation about what happens after the great lockdown with the notion that costs will go up, 
And maybe aside from these sort of really technology-driven weightless firms, it feels like we might have hit peak profitability in markets, if that's the case. And I'm just curious, with markets having bounced back from lows, how do you consider the future of these businesses in thinking through where you find great investment opportunities? I do think it's really about being an active investment manager. And while benchmarks and indices may be certainly, in the case of equities, assuming a very sharp V-shaped recovery and therefore quite buoyantly priced, finding select pockets, whether it's technology or other sectors in emerging markets where you are seeing companies with opportunities is important. I do think it's also the power of being in multiple asset classes the way we are. So we are thinking about opportunities now in direct lending and mezzanine, where you may find some very attractive pricing entering into the recessionary environment that we are now in. We are thinking about distressed opportunities. And in real estate, it is so localized in terms of the pricing trends. We fortunately have a portfolio that's quite resilient to sectors like hospitality and retail that suffered quite a lot in the crisis. But there will be new opportunities that come out of the repricing that this recession has driven. So we are still quite optimistic that this could be a good time over the now and the next six to nine months for investors to return to markets at a pretty attractive new pricing point. I want to circle back to PGM and in particular, just ask the question, you're working at a investment manager with over a trillion in assets that somehow, as you said, maybe is the best kept secret of the largest asset managers. What's been the key driver of the success of the asset growth and the products over the years? I think several factors. First, we have a model that treats asset management and investment management like a craft rather than a machine. We have businesses which have a group of senior leaders focused just on that single asset class, allowed to follow their own investment process with their own investment discipline. And without some of the confusion and noise that comes from broader integration, trying to do too many things. So I'd say the discipline and focus of our model is a key driver and the belief that it's a craft rather than a scaled technology company that we're trying to build. I think it's the long tenure of our teams. People come to the PGM to build a career. It's not a stopping point on the way somewhere. Our average tenure is 16 and a half years for our portfolio managers. That allows them to work well, not just remotely during the crisis, but have really intense, rich debates and come to the best answer because they've known each other and they've worked through different cycles and market environments. The pattern recognition is much longer. And third, I would say it's the long-termism. So even in our public businesses or the private businesses, the long-termism of our perspective allows us to be more disciplined in our risk management and to see through shorter term movements that might phase others. Well, Timer, I want to turn to a few closing questions before I let you go. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? So one of the little projects I'm doing is typography. I'm designing my own font. And living in New York City, one of the great benefits is there's a whole host of typographers. I didn't even know there existed communities that meet to critique fonts over beers in Brooklyn bars and can help you learn it. Typography is brilliant because it's all digital these days. But what really distinguishes a font is the ability to bring that human frailty into that digital font, which means it should have the same strokes as the initial original calligraphic instrument that created it, a broad nibbed pen or a chalk or an etching device. And it must have imperfections to not look too perfect and therefore capture the human eye. And what really matters is not the black of the letter, but the counters, the spaces between the letters. So I find great aesthetic beauty, digital perfection, the shape of the curves of each letter, the M, the A, really matter. And I'm devising my own font. Was there something that frustrated you about the litany of existing fonts that led you to that pursuit? I am quite obsessed with fonts, and I decided that I wasn't quite in love with the italics version of Garamond, which otherwise is my favorite font, as all my teams and colleagues and friends know. And I tried to just 
changed the italicization of Garamond and discovered that that's like adding a mustache to the Mona Lisa. Typographers frown on that. And so I had to turn to the drawing board and start a multi-year labor of love of beginning my own font using a range of incredible new digital tools that exist to do that, but also sketching out these letters. All right. Well, you may have answered this next one, but we'll try it anyway. If you started your career over today, money was no object and you couldn't be an investor or an academic, what do you think you'd like to do? So it wouldn't be typography because I think I only have one font in me. It would be to set up a uh, restaurant. I'm a big cook. And I think while I realize the financial risks of a restaurant, given that your question says money is no object, I would take one of the upstate New York highways, the Taconic Parkway, find an old diner that might be in bankruptcy, one of those beautiful buildings with red roofs next to a gas station, and convert it into a 16-seat restaurant that serves absolutely still serves grilled cheese sandwiches and burgers during the day, but becomes a small omakasi restaurant with a tasting menu with local ingredients in the evening, and spend my time designing craft cocktails and coming up with locally sourced ingredients and experimenting there. Well, here's a new one. What new habits have you developed during the pandemic? And we can go good and bad. And when we get to bad, just to be open about it, I have developed a daily habit of eating Fruit Loops, which is my Corona vice, if you will. We've probably all developed a few Corona vices, but in the same spirit, I would say one has been a slight obsession, which sadly is not unique when I look at people's Instagram feeds of baking banana bread and experimenting with different versions pretty much every second or third day. So I made one with hazelnuts instead of walnuts. I've had rum-infused raisins. I've uh, crush the walnuts to create a walnut flour instead of normal flour for a gluten-free version. So I think it's getting a little dangerous as a habit. And then a little bit of binge watching of television on weekends, particularly when it was a little cloudier and rainier in, in March. And my latest one is a book that I could never read called My Brilliant Friend, but that's been turned into an excellent HBO series about female friendship and two women growing up in a small Neapolitan town in the 1950s, and then it continues beyond that. That is just brilliantly done. What's your biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve is probably sloppy grammar and extra apostrophes where they don't belong, capitalization in the middle of sentences. I already mentioned I prefer Garamond to non Garamond, but things like that that lead to sloppy writing really irritate me. How about your biggest investment pet peeve? My biggest investment pet peeve is probably an over-reliance on trading algorithms and backtests that lack a foundation in underlying theory. Probably comes back to my academic roots. But while I believe big data is absolutely part of the answer and there's a lot of data analytics to do, I think you always want to be able to tell your clients when your particular source of alpha will work and when it won't work. And you can only do it if you truly understand the underlying mechanism rather than find spurious temporary correlations. Unfortunately, there's a lot of that going on. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I think what I value most is that they didn't try to make me images of themselves or better versions of themselves to fulfill goals in their lives that they didn't achieve. But they let me be myself. They let me indulge, often adding some guardrails and discipline around it but they let me indulge in in my discipline and trusted me. And I think I learned from that, that even in teams, let people be passionate and do what they want most. And that's what's most successful. There shouldn't be versions of time or versions of themselves and bringing those together in a team, that diversity of thinking is what's most powerful. And I think I learned that from my parents. Terrific. Timer, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Absolutely, that cut the bait sooner than I used to. I valued optionality too highly. I wanted options. I sometimes overinvested in things where I should have seen the signals that this isn't going to work and cut that particular investment, that particular idea sooner. And I think it's not about being ruthless. It's about being disciplined, trying lots of things, But also cutting loose quickly when you need to is something I do much more now. And I think it's a good thing. I wish I'd done it a decade or two ago. Tyron, this is fascinating. And I hope we'll do it again the next time your megatrends comes out. 
absolutely we covered a ton of ground it was just a fascinating chat from my perspective thank you for doing this Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 